Well, welcome back, everyone. I am Charlie Matthews. I am the founder and CEO here at Empowering Brands. Uh, we are at the Maintenance and Reliability Summit. We love, 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 love all of you people. So thank you for being a part of our community. And I'm excited to be here to just get to know, um, uh, I mean, get a refresher, I guess, for maintenance and rela reliability. Um, Marlon, thank you for bringing us this topic where we're going to talk about the evolution of reliability and maintenance strategy. So I really think um, for, for my own sake, kind of seeing where we have been and where we're going is really exciting uh, for our industry. So without further delay, Marlon, I will turn it over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Charlie. I appreciate it. Um, I've been with Hydro for 12 years now, and really Hydro for me has been a great experience because we adopt a lot of the holistic reliability mindset that George talked about, uh, which is great. And it's, it's, I've learned a lot from it and it's been fantastic doing it. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the evolution of reliability and maintenance strategies, but more specifically, how we really need to adopt this holistic mindset or um, systems thinking approach to uh, industry 4.0, how we kind of evolve into the next generation of reliability. Um, I'm going to try my best not to get into a sales pitch, but forgive me, I'm a salesman. I've been doing it for a long time and, and it's kind of hard to kind of uh, take me away from that. So really ultimately at the end of the day here, I really hope that this discussion promotes further discussions within your respective organizations um, and your roles and influence and leverage points within um, the system of reliability. So real quick, I'm going to go over uh, a quick uh, timeline and history of the service industry and reliability and maintenance practices. Then I'm going to touch on the growth of the rotating equipment industry to provide some additional context and um, some, some quantification of it. Um, and I'm going to talk about what systems thinking is. I'm going to talk a little bit about a uh, reliability system map that I kind of sketched up to try to give you an idea as to, to how it kind of all ties in together. And then finally, I want to talk about, you know, why this matters. What's the point of all of this? Like, why are we doing this? So I think we've all seen many of these timelines before, you know, the, the four generations of uh, an evolution of the maintenance industry. Um, it's worthwhile going back and just revisiting and have a look at it. Um, and you can go on the internet and you punch in a couple of keywords and you're going to get thousands of different images and results on this. Uh, and I think if we look at it and, and are honest with ourselves, we can each identify with being in different stages or different generations. And, you know, many of us will probably, you know, admit that we're still using a lot of practices from that first generation that run the fail maintenance strategy. And we haven't made that full step to that fourth, fourth generation or even third or even the second. And so um, that's okay. Uh, you don't need to be categorized into one but, and everybody's journey is going to be a little bit different. But ultimately, industry 4.0 is where we're at. So Industry 4.0, uh, to simplify it a little bit, it's really about communication and connecting all the tools that we've developed in Industry 3.0. It really is, is trying to blur those lines between um, different silos of information and data that we have currently collected and have collected in the past. And it kind of breaks down those silos, much like George talked about. And it kind of makes this shift over and increases collaboration and increases communication. And this fourth generation, this emphasis on more data uh, driven and collaborative approach to maintenance and reliability practices is really ultimately where we're going. Um, now, a key thing or a key part of this is this fully interconnected practice, it's gonna require a huge upskilling of our existing people and a mind shift sh uh, change. Um, Reliability can no longer be that necessary evil or witchcraft or magic. And we need to, in order to be successful to transition to Industry 4.0 and this full interconnectedness, we need to adopt this holistic mindset like George talked about or this systems thinking approach and understand the whole reliability system and that push-pull and the leverage points that are within it. 
Uh, we should talk a little bit about the growth of, of our industry um, because it will have significant impact on our reliability system map. So um, there's a lot of market researchers out there that are estimating uh, annual global annual growth rate for the rotating equipment market to be somewhere between four and 6% a year. Uh, why this is significant is that's two to three times more than what we've seen over the last five years. Um, this, this growth rate, as you can imagine, will have a significant impact and strain on our reliability system map. And it'll demand, increase that demand for skilled labor and resources. So continued disruption of a supply chain as well will continue to have a ripple effect throughout the whole reliability system of our equipment. And we need to be able to include this information in our, uh, our systems thinking and our map and our holistic thinking on uh, reliability of our machinery because it will continue to, to, to strain all the different uh, leverage points on it. And we'll see that a little bit more on the actual systems thinking map. So these are some of my systems thinking heroes. Uh, if you've ever come across them, uh, that's great. Um, uh, I just want to put them on the screen here and talk a little bit about what exactly systems thinking is for those that you know haven't 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 spent much time reading about it or looking into it. Um, there's a, a university uh, professor, Dr. Michael Martisak. He's at uh, University of Phoenix, and he teaches systems thinking, and he gives a really nice, simple explanation. And he basically says systems thinking is the exact opposite of siloed silo thinking and you know George had a great slide the crash down slide of silos right it's 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 broken it's done you're you're, you're moving away from that and so um, it's a great illustration and, and great way of looking at it um, you know Danella Meadows and Peter Senge they're both respected experts in their field with systems thinking and they really help educate and teach people uh, all about, you know, this interconnected, this, this system, uh, how to apply it, what does it mean to my business, how do, I, how do I put it into place? And, you know, what's interesting is, is this is, systems thinking has been around for a long time, you know, uh, you think about Russ Acoff, who worked with um, Edward, uh, Edward Deming on quality and, and whatnot, this, is, this isn't new, and what's fascinating is Industry 4.0, and it's, uh, its need for this interconnectedness and communication and collaboration approach really is systems thinking. So it's, it's kind of fascinating how we kind of, uh, almost history repeats itself to a certain extent, but getting sidetracked. So I'll try to stay on topic here. Um, Russ Acoff, by the way, uh, if you get a chance, he's got some great videos out on the internet on um, systems thinking. And um, there's a really great anecdote that he uses with uh, cars and how an automobile works as a system, but um, you can't just take bits and pieces from everywhere and just build a car and accept it to work, expect it to work. Uh, highly recommend it. And, and that's one of my favorite quotes on there that has less to do with systems thinking, but um, you know, he's, he's just a great, interesting uh, person to listen to the lecture. So uh, really encourage you to do that. Okay, so what I tried to do here is I started looking at the reliability map and reliability maintenance map. And I took uh, tools and, and that Danella Meadows and Peter Senge described. And I said, well, I'm going to limit myself to 10, 15 minutes and just kind of throw it down there. So it's kind of like a mind map. It's kind of uh, something similar to that. But you really want to kind of try to link together uh, some of the interconnectedness, different different influences and leverage points within reliability systems that can that can impact it. And so that's basically what I've done here. And again, I tried not to go into too much detail uh, because I have a tendency to go down rabbit holes and get distracted and, and, and expanding too much and focusing on one thing, which is the opposite of what we want to do. Again, we want to get away from that siloed thinking but rather look at everything from a holistic level, a 10,000 foot level, so that we can really understand, um, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the different influences and how different things can move. And that's really what P Peter Senge tries to, try to exemplify. Um, now, my map that I've thrown up here has my own bias in it from a service provider, 
from a sales perspective, and that's okay. Uh, it's important to recognize that and as your organization goes through and develops their own system map and how they influence and impact reliability, understand that there's gonna be your own inherent biases in there. Also okay, because all those different things are going to influence the overall system. Um, so I've tried to group these into six, six basic uh, uh, somewhat groups, if you will. Um, and, and they are a user group, there is a people, a social media, life cycle, innovation, and service provider group that kind of somewhat group some of those influence points that will impact overall um, reliability and maintenance of your equipment. So I'm gonna dig into these groups a little bit closer and just kind of clip some peaks on them. The first group that we really wanna consider is, is the user group. These are the people that are you know, running the equipment and the machinery. They arguably have the largest impact and direct impact, I should say, on the reliability and, and equip, uh, reliability of the machinery and equipment. Um, but if you look at the leverage points and interconnectedness of all of these two different other groups, you kind of get a better understanding as to which way other groups can also impact users and their ability to increase reliability. There's a lot of positive and, and negative influences on the other groups that can significantly impact the reliability of machinery. And, you know, of, of note too, I've kind of boxed out that buying decision. And what I really wanted to illustrate and capture there, the evolution of the buying decision that a lot of our users uh, have gone through over the last decade or, or two decades is it's become increasingly complex. You've got these large buying groups, these large influences that are all shaping together. And even George touched base on that too a little bit. You know, you've got a procurement person, for example, whose primary focus and value and silo thinking is tied in with that uh, economic buying decision. Whereas the reliability engineer is going to say, well, don't buy the cheap bearing, buy the expensive one because we need increased reliability. So these buying decisions are, 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 are becoming increasingly complex and have significant impact on the overall reliability of our equipment. So that's why I've kind of split that off even into a kind of a subgroup a little bit. There's also something that, you know, we, is worthwhile talking about. It's a little difficult to quantify. Um, if we look at, you know, environmental, social governance policies of organizations, they're continuously evolving and changing. And they will continue to have an impact on numerous aspects of that reliable system map. You know, there's a couple couple of leader lines that are splitting off there that are going to impact people and other areas of business. And so I'll, I'll touch on that, but keep in mind that all these different things are going to influence different aspects, not just the silo of the user group or that purchaser or that reliability engineer, but it's much bigger than that. Okay. So I want to talk about people and a couple of different things in here. Um, I, I think, you know, specific around today's conversation and where we're at, uh, impact of social media, um, organizations like empowering pumps and equipment, um, standards, symposiums, all of these different organizations, uh, while they don't necessarily group nicely together, I've kind of clustered them together a little bit for this, this slide's purpose, um, but there's a significant impact that they have on people and they have a significant impact, uh, maybe not as direct, but they do have a direct, or they have an impact on the reliability of our equipment. And so understanding that um, means that we have to include it in our reliability system map. Um, one thing I got kind of distracted with, where we're scribbling down notes, I think was with Sanya talking a little bit about um, the the loss of women and skilled labor in our workforce and charlie you touched on that too on how we how we've lost a significant number of skilled labor during the pandemic um you know the strain that's going to be put on people and and we're we're right now facing basically a shortage of skilled labor um within the uh within our industry and we already talked a little bit about industry 4.0 and that increased demand it's going to have on upskilling our people. We need to, we need to look at ways that we can um, uh, both empower our people, but 
give them the skills that they need to make uh, our systems more efficient and more reliable. Um, you know, an example of this uh, is, is one of the things that Hydro did during the, uh, during the pandemic is we were a fairly quick and early adopter when we, uh, to, to this type of learning environment where we are in a virtual environment, Hydro developed Hydro University, we did free webinars, and it's been a fantastic response. And we're actually able to upskill people within our industry at a much more rapid pace. So, um, you know, that's one good thing that came out of the uh, pandemic. But as, as we continue to uh, increase the need for more and more skilled workforce, um, we need to come up with more creative ways to kind of look at that. Um, one thing I touched on with the user group was the ESG policies and as they will continue to evolve and change and how, what impact that will have on the people that we need. You know, people are the center of our business. They're still the core of our business and ESG policies will continue to have significant impact on, you know, are the people going to stay in the industry? Are they going to stay in their jobs? Are they going to leave the industry for various reasons? Um, you know, that ties in a little bit too with what Sanya talked a little bit about why, why are women leaving our, our industry? You know, they get started and we've got this tradition, this fantastic skilled workforce, but we're losing them. And why is that? And so um, it ties in really nicely to that. But where I want to go also with that is, you know, coming back to this industry 4.0 and the evolution of our uh, reliability and maintenance system, um, we really need to consider that that collaboration needs to and uh, communication needs to increase. So, you know, sorry, I'm getting distracted here again, going down a couple different paths here, but um, okay. So I'm going to move and skip a little bit forward to innovation group, because this is kind of where I wanted to try to tie in a little bit. Um, the innovation grouping, uh, it provides us one of the largest potential can of worms. Um, there's a lot of different leverage points that would fall underneath innovation, and it doesn't have to necessarily be technology related. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the technology side of things, but um, I mean, keep in mind that innovation really is the result of our creativity. It's, it's that people, people's creativity and the freedom, and again, going back to empowering our people to be creative giving them that safe place to do, to, to come up with these new and innovative ways, uh, innovative ways to uh, boost our business. Um, so innovation really can touch and influence pretty much almost every other group that's out there. So it's a pretty important group in our reliability system map. Um, you know, I think if you polled everybody in this in this uh, session, they would probably all agree that they're getting daily conversations that surround, you know, uh, Internet of Things, condition monitoring, machine learning, artificial intelligence, you know, evolution of software, and of course, most recently, Chat GPT, and what impact that's going to have on our business. Um, you know, if we look at a uh, very popular topic of that condition monitoring. Um, you know, nobody's going to question that the importance of collecting the data, uh, we need the data, we need information, we need all of this, but that question needs to shift and say, well, what are we going to do with all of this? What are we going to do with all this information that we collect? Can we actually use it as a leverage point to increase reliability? Well, we know the answer is yes. But this depends pretty heavily on how connected it is with and integrated with our existing systems. You know, this is really what Industry 4.0 is talking about. It's integration of technology across all platforms to streamline our process, increase our efficiency, and ultimately free up our valuable resources like the people that are over leveraged right now. And if our skilled and unskilled for workforce is consumed with trying to analyze these data, this data and it doesn't connect and streamline the process, then we're potentially creating an excess of demand on our people that are already so over, over uh, leveraged. So as we look to adopt new software, IoT devices, data analysis, and in our organization, organizations, we really need to think about 
full integration with existing systems. It becomes so critical. Um, you know, another hydro example, uh, we've worked on our Centaur uh, condition monitoring equipment. And, and really the focus has been on the software to make it easily, uh, easy to integrate with whatever systems are in place in existing users and, and, and whatnot. And then the second part of that is, is the user interface streamlined and simple enough so that it actually comes and becomes a productive tool for those um, uh, rotating equipment specialists and whatnot. So, you know, this is, this is all part of it. And as that software continues to evolve and incorporates more machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, we really need to consider that it has to uh, be a collaborative uh, system with the existing systems that our users have. Uh, now, uh, ChatGPT, I just want to touch on it real quick. Um, ChatGPT, for those who don't know, is the most downloaded piece of software in the last six months in the history of, well, software, basically, our computers, right? So um, it has had a significant impact on our businesses and our everyday lives already, and will continue to do so, particularly as they launch the next system or the next evolution of chat GPT here. I think that's coming out this summer or right away. I think the early versions have already got come up for testing, but it's irrelevant. If you haven't, if you haven't fully used it or explored it, I encourage you to do that. Um, careful on the internet, as always, if you go and start searching, how can I use chat GPT? You could spend hours reading about it. So here's the thing. Here's what I encourage you to do is go on chat GPT, create an account, and put a 30 second prompt in saying, how will chat GPT uh, be useful to me and my role and my job today? So um, throw that out there, see it, see what comes out, see how it kind of dumps out information. Um, could be interesting exercise for you. Okay, last I wanna talk about is the service providers. That's, that's, that's my group, that's my, that's my area. Um, there's a couple key leverage points or relationships that I want to highlight and just talk briefly about as it relates to Industry 4.0. Um, this, you know, there's a there's a big shared leverage point or influence point in um, in the service providers in that it's tied in with the supply chain. That supply chain is is shared and leveraged by so many. Uh, and as we can all attest to right now, um, it, is, it, is, it is hurting all of us. It is, is struggling at this time with being over leveraged. You know, Russ Acoff would ask us to, or would suggest that we identify ways to eliminate the problem or dissolve it rather than try to solve it. And I don't think this is a, a possible necessary with supply chain, but the innovation and creativity or the innovation stream can influence and potentially have on, on relieving some of that stress and strain on the uh, on the supply chain system, you know, companies like Hydro are also one of those early adopters when it comes to new innovative ways of trying to do things. Things like additive manufacturing, for example, which is kind of in the service provider uh, grouping, but really could be underneath innovative side of things. If we look at how ChatGPT will innovate, will inf technology and particularly additive manufacturing uh, side of things, it will accelerate uh, the ability for things like additive manufacturing to release some of the strain off of our supply chain. So what? So you're thinking, okay, we're at this great Marlin, what's the point? Where are we gonna go with this? Um, we know that service industry is continuously evolving and is trying to move its way through that fourth industrial revolution and that there needs to be that mind shift. Um, this transition into this next generation ever emphasizes really data-driven, more collaborative approach to reliability and this need for upskilling people. If we're to be successful in this transition, we have to adopt a systems thinking mindset. Danelle Meadow always said, you know, we can't impose our will on the system, but we can bring forth something better than what we could be produced on our will alone. Um, partnerships with organizations like Hydro, 
um, you know, events like this where we are collaborating, talking together, are all going to uh, uh, provide additional new ways of looking at our reliability system, helping it evolve. Um, you know, and, and and companies like Hydro that are trying to be in, a, in and understand the entire system and be leaders within that in that providing that total solution are going to play an important role. So this now becomes a discussion then within your own organizations. Where do you fit in? Where are your partners in? Who are you collaborating with? Who are you communicating with? And is that actually um, over leveraging your that skilled labor force that you have? or is it over, over leveraging them, so to speak? You know, there's already talk about Industry 5.0, and while we're a long ways away from that, um, you know, we need to first understand how the fourth generation, how the system of reliability and maintenance uh, really impacts us today and where we fit in it. All right, I think I'm out of time here right away, but um, I really appreciate you guys letting me talk a little bit about something that's near and dear to my heart and that I love to talk about and, and I kind of could go on and, and, and just get distracted about. But uh, again, I appreciate it. If there's any questions or anything like that, uh, fire away. Thank you, Marlon.